They're gonna, each one's going to be a different material, but not the material that it looks like. Like if it's brick, it's going to be in wood. If it's going to, you know, and so forth down down the line. So everyone will have a house that's not in the material that it looks like, but it is kind of thing, you know. <laughs> um, this is the project for Venice, which is pretty familiar now because it's pretty well known. The idea was this building is an old grain mill that was owned by the Communist Party. And what they wanted to do is convert it to a community center, but they wanted to achieve some kind of identity since they're right across from the historic center. Well, if you know Venice, you know it's impossible to compete with a historic center. So what, what we're trying to do is, well, first the idea was to take advantage of that idea of Venice, is Venice coming or going? That was one idea. Uh, and take it in its various, you know, that, that ambiguity. And then we got more into it, and uh, we decided that one of the great dialogues of Venice is, of course, the ornate building reflected into the, into the water. And we thought it would be really intriguing to re invert that relationship and put the water where the facade is and the facade where the water is. So you're walking on, on, in a sense, what you're looking at. It would have, again, a kind of metaphysical feeling because you're standing and looking at what you're walking on. And we we're going to put the clock and the windowsills. The windowsills themselves, which are, you know, stick up, would be like seating and, you know, it would be exact replica of the existing facade. And then we would put that skin of glass and then water. So you have the water and you have that reverse relationship. Um, also, this would be nice for, you know, just a pier and, you know, pull the gondolas up and all that kind of thing. Uh, another thing where I've been intrigued with, of course, is Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, he's one of my great heroes. And yet you cannot go back to the Wrightian era. You can't go back to the kind of that incredible integration of art and architecture in that sense, or nature and architecture, because this is, after all, the world that we are find ourselves working in a lot. And so we're dealing with some projects uh, that deal with nature, one of which is I've always been intrigued by the invasion of nature, nature you know, consuming architecture rather than the other way around. And uh, this is a site that we had in South San Francisco. We lost this original site, but I think we're getting another one that's even better. Um, but it was this great plateau in South San Francisco. And, um, you know, I've, again, a, another intriguing thing is what do, they, what do they do with all that dirt and rock that they dig up to make a building? Where does it all go? I mean, they just, you know, they use it for landfill or they take it away. And I thought it would be interesting to have the building as a biography of its own excavation. So the idea is to dig up the whole building and make a glass skin around the building and then just insert the strata of the earth. So it's an exact geological reading of South San Francisco. So you walk up to a living iconography. You walk right up to the wall and the whole thing comes alive. And of course, after in time, you know, there'd all be sorts of little insects and animals running through the wall. And you know, you'd find people with their noses right up against the wall eventually watching watching the iconography grow. And then we we're going to plant the roof. This is by the, just a sample of a, of a, of a section. Uh, we're, we're testing section. And um, what it was is really, it's a skin with allowing about eight or 10 inches, and then we just make an infill. And we'd have places on the inside of the building so that there would also be walls the same. So it really was though you were inside a wall of earth. And um, it also it takes into account this thing I've always been intrigued with in Duchamp's uh, glass is the idea of the fixed work of art, which is the painting existing on one level, but you have to reconcile, because it's transparent, all the activity in the, well, this is in Catherine Dreyer's apartment, but the activity of the garden has to be reconciled in terms of the fixed elements of the work of art. And this kind of, you know, encompassing the world is intriguing. I thought that the skin of the terrarium would be, in fact, the building, and then you look into the wall for this kind of microcosmic world within, you know. And then the roof, of course, is going to be planted. And we got a lot of offers from landscape architects on how to do this. And we had some interesting um, suggestions on how to, you know, decrease the weight and everything. But again, in terms of energy conservation, this is, would be in a phenomenal building. And now the new version of it is going to be even more underground. It's going to be almost totally underground, except for the front elevation, which you know, just merges right out of the hillside. Um, this is a modified, this is a water building we did in Florida on a canal. Uh, actually what we did is we cut away exactly a certain landscape and we decided we would replace the landscape identically where the building was. What we cut away, we would replace and then we put a, 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 this kind of waterfall, this huge 250 foot waterfall in the building. So it's like a, everything is blurred. You never quite see anything clearly. This isn't fully done by the way. The planning all comes down to the top now. It's, it's a very lush environment at this point. <laughs> But it's kind of nice because you, you, again, it has a modified terrarium and then it has this kind of strange feeling of taking in the environment. It's like when you watch, look at the building, you realize that behind it is exactly what was there before and you kind of make this 
this connection in your mind. It also does strange things to their signage. You know, we had to inherit their new logo, by the way. We got this from Chermayev, and it was very difficult because we'd always depended on kind of the banality of their imagery as our subject matter, and then suddenly they had a fancy logo on our, you know, we had to deal with it. But this is how we got rid of it. Also, you know, everybody tells you a building shouldn't look like a postcard, and this looks exactly like a postcard. You know, I mean, it's really, it's a perfect postcard building, you know. Uh, and it takes on, you know, very nice meanings at different times of day and so forth. Um, the last, well, oh, this is another nature project. This is a site. It's a kind of a big clearing with all these huge trees going through it. And what we're going to do is leave all of these trees, every one we can possibly leave, and we're just going to, well, these are some <laughs> ideas. We're either going to, uh, this is one of the first ideas. We found out we couldn't build a foundation with this idea. So what we're really, really going to do is we're going to march right through the building. We're just going to, you know, come up to the building and then just take this huge procession of trees, which will go right through the <laughs> central building. And it'll be nice, because when you walk up to the building, you'll walk through trees, and then through the wall, and then into trees, and then, you know, it'll just kind of successive dimensions of nature. And again, this idea of nature's revenge, you know, the nature consumes the building. Uh, fragmentation, I've always loved, you know, like the Gaudi facades in Barcelona, the Sagrada Familia, and, you know, the idea of the isolated architectural element. And in the Florida building, we did that, exactly that. It's, again, it's a, a building that is in section to part. It just comes apart in space. You, again, can choose your own scale reference. And uh, it comes down to you. Uh, it's nice because um, <laughs> you really, like, people like, walk through. And, and, and it's funny uh, to see people psychologically. They come up to the door, you know, and they know they could walk around, but they don't. You know, you kind of <laughs> go through. Because it, it's a door, after all. It also is like a triumphal arch, which is nice because it's like if you designed a triumphal arch in the 20th century, you'd have to put a glass door in it. You know, it seems like a logical thing to do. It also fuses in space. It's really, this is a really like a jigsaw puzzle because as you're driving by, you see, it becomes, it fuses back into itself and becomes the perfect best building again. It becomes the normal building. And it has this kind of nice light shadow thing. It's very, very adaptable to the Florida, very Florida-oriented, I think, in that sense. This is, again, a, a Widlinger achievement, 200-foot-long hanging brick wall. It's nice to see the workers up there threading the brick upside down, too. It's really kind of interesting. <laughs> this is the most metaphysical part. It's where you, like, when you walk through one door, and then 50 feet away, you see the same door you walk through. You know, and it has that kind of really strange going through space. It's also based, to some extent, on the decurical fragments and the using of light and shadow, because it definitely has that feeling, the long shadows and the, the night. And, you know, it has a strange mystical. You get, at night, it does, takes on a whole kind of apparition quality. Well, anyway, that's all. And I just, the ideas that I want to leave with you or implant in you and to think about anyway was this question of the difference between architecture as art versus architecture as design. And the idea that we use a lot, which is architecture as an idea versus architecture as a study or an exercise in form and space and structure. And then finally, the using of architecture as the raw material. This is a kind of controversial idea because architects say, well, if it's the raw material, then what do you do? Well, what we really do is we do indeed design the facilities. In other words, we decide what the pragmatic choices are. We make them as simply and as pragmatically as possible. Then that gains a certain distance. And then you try to recycle this thing through a different frame of reference, which is an art frame of reference, I guess it would have to be called. And these are the four principles, or ones that's what they all look like. This is Emilio Sosa, uh, who is really the one responsible for getting them all up. And uh, that's Alison Skye. She works with me on the concepts. And Michelle Stone is the businesswoman, without which there would be no site, I'll tell you. She's incredible. And that's me, and that's all. Thank you. If there are any questions, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll take them on. Pardon? Uh, you mean the one that just came out? Well, they're sitting at the airport. There's a, there's a, we haven't picked them up, I'm afraid. Um, there is a book out now. On, there, well, there are several books coming out, but the first of them, and I'll send some out here uh, to you, as a matter of fact, uh, books on site. There's one on our theories. It's kind of a little theoretical book. It's like a pocketbook. 
And then there's a big one coming out in the fall from Rizzoli's, and then there's one coming out on Frank, Gary, and, and me, and I think maybe Tigerman or something, three, three Americans. And so there are going to be some books, and I will send them to the school when, when I get them. I definitely will. But anyway, is there, are there any questions? I mean, I, I, I can't believe. Well, yeah, everybody asks that because they are remarkable people. I think that that probably is the other lesson of the evening. Find yourself a patron. Um, really, um, I was at the Institute, and Mrs. Lewis, who is Sidney Lewis's wife, uh, and they're man and wife, and they are responsible. They're not only incredible art collectors, but they're also now, as you know, architectural patrons as well. And. Um, you know, we, they were talking about this difference between what is a client and what is a patron. A client is usually a person who, you know, gives you a hard time, and a patron is a person who believes in the cause. And I think that that's really what, you, I, I, really, it's a good, tip, a good tip. I think that that's, in a sense, what we did. We finally decided that here were these people. They were sensitive. They had an incredible art collection. Um, they've been art collectors for 20 years. I guess they have one of the biggest pop art collections in, in, in the world. I mean, it's an, an Art Nouveau collection. It's incredible. If you're ever in Virginia, it's worth seeing it, really it is. It's, it's going to eventually, they're building a wing in the museum for it now, I think, this year. But it's still, you can go through their house, like, you know, they have a, a tour through the house. I mean, it's incredible, really. But they're just basically enlightened people who are interested in the arts. And uh, I think they think of the buildings as their art collection. People are always, you know, writing things like, I don't know, they did it for the money. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's so difficult to get buildings like this built that I think they're happy when, you know, they are successful. If the community responds, they're happy because I guess it's indirectly good for business. But it's pretty much like buying a painting and finding out it's worth more. Uh, that's never been their motivation. I think that they're genuine patrons. And I think that the thing to do is what we did. We just found them and we persuaded them to let us do a renovation. And then they said, well, let us do a building and then let us do two buildings. And now our whole contract with them is for 15 buildings and we've done seven or eight. And we're now working on a lot of other things. I and mean, we have some other clients. We're doing some banks now. We're doing some landscape stuff. We're doing a, a variety of things, some house, houses, we hope. And, uh, but the Lewises themselves are, um, are publicity shy, as you can imagine. I mean, they are never in the press. I mean, they, they won't ever be interviewed or anything. But they're, to know them personally, they're just marvelous people. I mean, I can't say enough about them, because obviously they've, they've made our, our quest possible. But I think it really has been a very important thing because they're supportive in terms of the idea. That is like if any problem that comes up, their idea is, my God, they're not going to get in our way. We're going to do it. You know, we're going to let's see how we can get it done. Let's let's talk to them. Maybe we can, you know, we can talk some sense into them or something like that. Because you're always dealing with the design review board and you know the building department and and uh, you know like in, in Texas we had the AIA up in arms. They had a they had a they had a meeting when they heard that our building was going to be built, or it was halfway built, actually. And they decided they would, they would try to prevent buildings like that being built because it took jobs away from real architects. <laughs> and um, so we've had our problems, and they have been supportive. I mean, that is the most important thing. And I really think that for, for trying to do experimental things or trying to do creative things, I think it's really important, and I think everybody should just sort of identify somebody somewhere. Because I, 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 there's just got to be, you know, I'm, I'm always convinced it's just out there, there's got to be somebody. Now, interestingly enough, we do have clients, and it's quite a bit more difficult, a lot more. I mean, we're beginning to have to face reality in a different way, because they're not as amenable, they're not as sympathetic, they're not into the messianic cause of de-architecture or whatever. I mean, you know, they, they just want their building done at the lowest possible cost, and, you know, they hired us because we're famous. I mean, that's about it. And um, it's, it's quite a different thing entirely. I mean, I, I don't know if that answer, that's a, a long answer to a short question, but I thought it's important because I think patronage, the concept of patronage is, is rare, and I think it's important. Okay, any other um, questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's probably, it's a very fine line. And with, this is like the all-day discussion. You know, how, what is the fine line? It is a very, it's an indefensible argument. I, you know, I admitted it almost in advance. The problem is I think that we all sense there is a difference. There is definitely a difference between something you, and I think we'd probably all instantly agree on what succinctly comes off as a genuine work of art or where the intent was art and where the intent was a kind of application or, or something which the aesthetic 
somehow was compromised or somehow was less important than solving the problem. I think there's a very fine line we're walking here. I realize I'm creating an indefensible argument. It's only, it's, it's like, well, Duchamp also said it's art if I say it is. You know, in a sense, I, 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 use, I fall back on that indefensible argument. It's, it's art if I say it is. You know, see what I mean? I mean, <laughs> it's, I mean, your question is very well taken. It's obviously the first question. I think it's something in sensibility. It's a sense of, yeah, you know, we have the biggest problem. For example, we suddenly inherited the Chermayev well-designed logo. Now, part of our subject matter was obviously the fact that the logo and best product was the dumbest little logo in the world. No, it wasn't designed by an artist. It was designed by somebody in the company who took a pencil and said, that's the way it's going to look. And it's so, you know, it's so automatic, that kind of thing. It's, again, it, it's like if you're going to make a collage, you don't make a collage out of a fancy page of Vogue. You usually tear up the morning newspaper, and somehow it works in because it's kind of a question of choice. Now, the best products buildings, which in fact became our subject matter, were came with all of that inherent reflex identification. They came with all of that. Suddenly a, des a designer comes in and plunks down a fancy logo. See, they're upgrading now. You know, in a sense, I'm glad we're getting out of town because uh, you know, really, we're, we're gonna finish our projects and I think that's gonna be it because they're tending as a corporation to upgrade. This has nothing to do with the Lewises because they're you know, kind of almost out of it now. And uh, they're tending to upgrade and that's the worst thing they could do to our subject matter. It's like, you know, suddenly you're, you're, again, you're like Picasso says, you're working with old shoes, and suddenly somebody gives you a fancy patent leather and says, do something. It's a different thing entirely. So it's a definitely this design, undesign. I mean, it's a, it's a very fine line to walk. I mean, how much should you do before you're started to design? Yeah. yeah. Precisely. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a motivation. I think it's how you sense your motivation. I think it's how you perceive the situation, how much you let the problem, whether the problem is your subject matter. I think that's the difference. If the problem becomes your subject matter, then I think probably it's more art. If the problem becomes the controller, it becomes more design. Do you see what? Huh? Well, bec but see, paradigms are, are perfect. No, I'm saying you do design. What you do is you solve the problems as one issue. And, and usually, we, what we try to do is solve it in the most rhetorical way. That is, in other words, the best possible hospital, the simplest access, the simplest kind of room, chamber, operating room, substructure, whatever. Solve it well, then stand back from this creation which then becomes independent and try to reconceive it or see it in another dimension of meaning. I think that is a, it's a tough process, I know. I mean, it's hard to explain. It's also tough with the creation. It's hard I know. To follow. We're just putting this in things and saying, well, we'll just take care of this quickly on the fly and this will do our art more than this one. Well, I mean, it could be. I mean, it's been criticized as that. And, you know, if after all I've said this evening that that impression still comes through, that's, that's your prerogative to think so, but I think not. I think it's probably quite different than you think. I think that you can do very little and change the meaning of something rather radically. Well, it would be appropriate to anything that I think where you, you have a strong sense of what a, a type is. A house, it could be a house. I probably, you know, a house would be for us this, I mean, a very simple object which one calls a house. In other words, again, you're talking about tightrope, fine line sensibility. In other words, you'd have to give the problem first and see how it would be approached, because it is always a problem. You're absolutely correct. Every pragmatic problem is a problem. But I'm not necess it isn't necessary to make a piece of sculpture out of the problem. I guess that's what I'm saying. That it was the only way of making that problem come to life as sculpture or as art is not, you know, with the, the traditional means. I'm saying there are other investments of meaning that that problem can have. You can do a hospital and it could mean something quite different than the typical hospital worked out according to, you know, architectural, usual architectural systems. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to explain, obviously. You're, it's so subjective that, you know, it's impossible. That's why I feel I know I'm working in dangerous ground, so I always, you know, apologize first before I say these things. Because um, they are, you know, it's like we in our office argue these things all the time. I mean, somebody, you know, it's very funny. Once we, we hire people sometimes, and we, we set up a very, uh, in a sense, for one particular problem, a very rigid frame of meaning. Like, I don't know, the best products building has three doors, so we'll never change the three doors. All of a sudden, you put a fourth door in, and, and somebody say, you, you, 
that that's immoral. You did that. You, you changed it. Therefore, you're play, not playing the game. You know, you're not playing the game fairly. And it's true. It's very, very difficult to, again, like inheriting the fancy logo. What do you do with it now? Do you accept it as part of the typology, or do you get rid of it altogether? And first of all, we're not going to have it put on any of our buildings. No, not on my building, you know, that kind of thing. But that isn't right either, because that's part of the company, you see. Is that part of the subject matter, or is that not part of the subject matter? I'm trying to hold yeah. to another ground. Yeah. Well, well, they could, but so far, well, it's, that's speculative. Let me say they could, but so far they don't. Because I said we've had pretty good public reaction. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I would say that um, I, I can't really, I mean, we have an awful lot of favorable, you know, controversial, obviously, but we have an awful lot of responsive. Well, again, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> art is a dangerous game. I mean, I think that, um, I quoted this quote to somebody the other day, and they're asking me you know, uh, about this problem. I think I, I said it to either Jacqueline or somebody here that one of my favorite quotes from um, Oscar Wilde is that you know, an idea that isn't dangerous isn't worthy of being called an idea at all. So obviously, artist has a danger factor, a risk factor. You, you are risking that people are not going to like it. But on the other hand, if it's somehow right, it eventually will pervade the culture. It'll become part of it. You take that risk, obviously. You could be wrong. You're absolutely right. And uh, so we take that risk as well as you do. But, you know, we hope we're right. I mean, what can I say? Yeah. Um, you were screaming a lot about the idea, the idea and the idea yeah. Well, that's always at first. I mean, that's that, but that, that is the same argument that's been presented at least 30,000 times in the 20th century. Every time an unfamiliar art movement or idea comes about, the first thing, it's not art. Yeah. I don't know. Time can only, you have to test with time. I would say one thing is what's interesting. Let me give you one example, though. A uh, German magazine went to Texas recently to kind of re-review the Houston building. I mean, based on the argument, you know, you've seen it once, you've seen it all kind of thing, um, to see how the community had adapted. What did they think of the building? Because they knew for a fact that now it's a tourist place. I mean, there's a bus that goes by it off the Gulf Highway. It's become a monument. Uh, but how did the community feel? So they asked the lady right across the street whose house faces the building every day. And they, and they said to her, they said, well, what if we took, you know, what if they straightened that building out? I mean, what if they made that building straight now? She said, oh, my God. She said, then it wouldn't be normal. Yeah, so you see, it's amazing how a thing can, you know, integrate and ingratiate itself, even though it starts, you know, in a sense. I think the shock element, I mean, Joseph Boyce said it very well. He was being criticized for the same thing. And he said, if it wasn't interesting, I wouldn't be here. And that's what he said at his lecture. And it's true. If it wasn't interesting, it, it, it wouldn't be art. I mean, you have to look at it. You have to have some kind of appeal. You have to have something to grab your attention. Then, if you investigate it and find it has no substance, then you, you know, you can dismiss it. But, you know, give it some time. I mean, you know, it's fairly new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. But that's what I said. In other words, I'm just saying from our point of view versus, as I said also at the beginning, that public art you know, is what it is. You have no control. That's part of the game. I mean, you have to put it out there. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, let's, let's say that. I mean, Frank Stella's early paintings, they look like pinstripe suits. I was walking through the Whitney Museum, uh, Cy Twombly's about graffiti. I mean, you know, those are, I mean, that's elementary. I mean, we're, we're talking to sophisticated people in this room. That's what I'm saying. I mean, those are elementary arguments. I mean, Obviously, it's like all the people who saw faces in Jackson Pollock paintings. You know, I, go, I see a face, you know. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Yeah. It has something to do with missing parts or the sense of, you know, building and unbuilding, perhaps, but not decay. I, 
not, I would say missing parts or unbuilding and building maybe or you know the 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 juxtaposition of best and you know the things I were talking about you know I, I don't know yeah yeah all right let, let's let the last question then we're done Well, I think it's served its client well, yeah, I think it has. I mean, after all, our buildings are $35 a square foot, and as I pointed out the other day, Philip Johnson's average was $175 a square foot. So at $35 a square foot, we've done all right for him, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they aren't. They aren't directly metaphorical. We're really not. We're more into phenomenological things, influences. I mean, things like kind of subconscious things you feel about, well, I said indeterminacy, um, entropy, I mean, things, how things affect you thinking about things. They're not direct metaphors, I and mean, we're not trying to symbolize products. In a way, if, if it's a commentary, he mentioned that it might be a commentary. Well, if it's a commentary, then it's a commentary on consumer culture, maybe. A lot has been written about that, for example. You see what I mean? It's not a direct, you know, for example, we have a thing for blue jeans now, a, um, oh, for Levi. Now, Levi is very intense about their history and their product, and they want us to symbolize their product. And, you know, that's not what we're going to do, you know. <laughs> they don't know it, but it's just not. Because, you know, I mean, it just isn't that large an issue. It isn't that kind of embracing, you know. It, it, well, yeah, I mean, one lady said about the Houston building, she says, my God, she says, you know, it says, there's enough people running out of money without showing it. I mean, you know, there's, you know, some people think of them as being unfinished or, you know, or like, that sense. Anyway, let's have, let's have, oh, more? Okay, one more, and that's it. <laughs> oh, you heard, let her, let, let a woman speak, go ahead. All right. <laughs> yeah, the question was, why has it been turned down in L.A.? I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's a perfect showcase, it's true. Uh, I don't know. That's why I'm out here trying to win friends. <laughs> I have no idea. Thank you. Bye -bye.